guys. So let's just hash this out quick. If it is, we'll say, 0.35 gallons, <clears throat> and if it takes one second for that to, for, to traverse your float down that channel, and that's 0.35 gallons, that means in a minute you've moved 21 gallons. So then from there you can basically say uh, quite easily how much actual volume you're moving. All you got to do is take a measurement in seconds and crunch those numbers like that. I'll uh, throw a formula up quick and then, uh, and then you have your volume flow. And uh, of course, depending on your water source, you should adjust this for the time of year. Uh, if you have dry seasons, your water flow will likely reduce. So uh, try to design a, a ram pump system that will work at the minimum water flow for the season so you have guaranteed water delivery throughout the season. Uh, I have another video on ram pump scalability. You can actually take a larger ram pump design and scale it down with a smaller impetus valve. So that is also an option and I discovered that after building the one and a half inch during dry seasons and I was able to scale down to even as small as a one inch valve delivers a lot less water but sometimes some water is better than none. Okie doke. Well, now we're going to get into the meat of it. First, we'll start with just going through the operation description uh, as they describe it, because they do a very good job of describing it. So let's start with that. Operation. The pump will require some back pressure to begin working. A back pressure of 10 PSI or more should be sufficient. If this is not provided by elevation induced back pressure from pumping the water uphill to the delivery point, water trough, barrel, etc., use the three quarter valve, part seven, to throttle the flow somewhat uh, to provide this back pressure. So basically, you're closing the output valve to create back pressure so the pump will run. It won't run under zero back pressure. You need to have some resistance, otherwise, there's not enough pressure uh, to keep it functional. As an alternative to throttling valve part 7, you may consider in the running the outlet pipe into the air in a loop and then back down to the trough to provide necessary back pressure. A total of 23 feet of, 23 feet of vertical elevation above the pump outlet should be sufficient. Notice how that corresponds if you divide 23 over 0.433 pounds per square inch. That gives you that 10 PSI they're talking about. So we covered that before. Just wanted to reference it so you understand where the 23 feet is coming from. This may not be practical in all cases, but adding 8 feet of pipe after piping up a hill of 15 feet in elevation should not be a major problem. This will allow you to open valve number 7 completely, preventing stoppage of flow by trash or sediment, blocking the partially closed valve. It is a good idea to include a T at the outlet of the pump with a ball valve to allow periodic flushing of the sediment just in case. And you'll notice if you go back and look at the video on my pump, you'll see I have a, a T in there and you can flush right out directly. And I highly recommend that. That's super effective for flushing. And also if you end up wanting to pump water somewhere else, you can just plug a garden hose in or, or whatever your fitting is and uh, move water elsewhere. You can use it for washing uh, stuff up when you're working on the pump or whatever. Very handy to have a secondary outlet. Anyway. Initially, the pump will have to be manually started uh, several times to remove all the air. Start the pump by opening the valve 1 and leaving valve 7 closed. Uh, we'll just go back to this diagram quick so you know what I'm talking about here. Valve 1, this is the output valve. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the, valve, the inlet valve. And valve 7 is the out outlet valve. So valve 1, valve 7 pressure chamber, pressure gauge, delivery line, drive pipe coming in on this side. Uh, seven, let's see, the pump will start with valve 7 closed completely, pumping up to some maximum pressure. Uh, start the pump by opening the valve 1 and leaving valve 7 closed. Then, when the swing check number 4 shuts, manually push it open again. You'll have to do this several times till it builds up enough pressure to operate on its own. The pump will start with valve 7 closed completely, pumping up to some maximum pressure before stopping operation. 
After the pump begins operation, slowly open valve 7, but do not allow the discharge pressure, read the pressure on the gauge, to drop below 10 psi. Uh, if you don't have a gauge, just very gently crack that valve open. Um, I, I use the ball gate valves because they're a nice simple valve, but you might be better off as far as that goes for regulation using the, uh, the older screw type valve where it's multiple turns. Uh, so you might consider that in your design. I may have to push valve number four open repeatedly to restart the pump the first few minutes. Uh, 10 to 20 times is not abnormal. Depending on your situation, I would say you could go up to 50 times. Uh, if you've seen my uh, recent videos, um, the the pump starts up, I think it's like five or six. Uh, but this pump, my pump is really tuned in now. I've really uh, gotten it dialed in. Uh, anyway, air in the system will stop operation until it is purged. Uh, they're specifically talking about air in the drive pipe, as we were talking about. You have to eliminate all air on the drive pipe. So before you even start this process, you want to make sure that your standpipe or your water source and your drive pipe are completely full and all the bubbles have bubbled back out through the top. So it may take, you know, 20 or 30 seconds for all those bubbles to work their way out before you start up. The unions, gate or ball valves, and pressure gauge assembly are not absolutely required to make the pump run, but they sure do help in restalling, removing, and starting the pump, as well as regulating the flow. And I'll add to that, uh, another thing that the, the pressure gauge is very useful for is if you end up with a leak in your delivery line later on, especially if you're pumping to pretty high elevations, like mine, for example, pumps 72 vertical feet and about 900 feet distant. Um, you can use that pressure gauge to figure out where your leak is roughly in the line by looking at the pressure gauge and doing the elevation calculation and you know the approximate area to look on the line. I've got a video on that too. Uh, maybe I'll throw a link down below if I can remember when I'm done crunching all this. Uh, Alright, pump performance. Some information suggests that typical ram pumps discharge approximately 7 gallons of water through the waste valve for every gallon pressurized and pumped. The percentage of the drive water delivered actually varies based on the RAN construction, vertical fall to the pump, and elevation to the water outlet. The percentage of the drive water delivered, delivered varies from approximately 22% when the vertical fall to the pump is half or 50% of the elevation to the water outlet, down to 2% when the vertical fall is 0 .04 or 4% of the elevation to the water outlet. Rife Hydraulic Engine Manufacturing Company offers the following equation. And I would say this equation is very effective. It's 0.6 times Q times F over E equals D. And we'll go ahead and break that out. Q is the available drive flow in gallons per minute. F is the fall in feet from the water source to the ram. E is the elevation from the ram to the water outlet and D is the flow, flow rate of the delivery water in gallons per minute. 0.6 is an efficiency factor and will differ somewhat between various ram pumps. For instance, if 12 gallons per minute is available to operate a ram pump, then the pump is placed 6 feet below the water source. The water will be pumped up an elevation of 20 feet. The amount of water that may be pumped with, approximately, with an appropriately sized ram pump is 0.6 times 12 gallons a minute times 6 foot over 20 foot equals 2.16. So 0.6 is the efficiency, 12 gallons a minute is delivery into the drive pipe, 6 foot is the fall from the water source to the ram, and 20 foot is the vertical head from the ram pump to the delivery point. Please pay special attention to this. This is not the distance from the water source to the delivery, this is the distance from the ram pump to the delivery in vertical head. And so that equates out at 2.16 gallons a minute. The same pump with the same drive flow will provide less flow if the water is to be pumped to a higher elevation. For instance, using the data in the previous example, but increasing the elevation lift to 40 feet. 0.6 times 12 gallons a minute times 6 foot of fall over 40 foot of delivery point works out to about 1.08 gallons a minute. So you notice if you double the delivery height, you about half the water volume. It's almost exactly half according to the formula. Obviously in real time it may fluctuate a little bit.
Anyway, that brings us down to this table here, table two. This is gold. This is gold. This gives you the general parameters, and this is one of the charts that was super useful for me on, you know, what size ram pump am I going to design based on the water flow I have, and what can I expect to deliver up top. Now, uh, I mentioned previously that I use Google Earth and GPS and actual measurements in the field. I initially took GPS data for my delivery elevation from Google Earth. I knew it wasn't super accurate, but I didn't think it would be quite as far off as it turned out to be. According to Google Earth, elevation from my ramp pump to the delivery point would be about 42 feet. And in real time, after I started pumping, I found out it's 72 feet. So uh, I was expecting about a gallon and a half a minute, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I was expecting somewhere around a gallon and a half a minute based on this chart here. If you look at the uh, drive pipe at inch and a half, three quarter inch output for delivery pipe. Uh, and I expected a pump inflow of around 12 to 15 gallons a minute. And I figured around about a gallon and a half a minute delivery but that was based on a 42 foot elevation and since it turned out to be a 72 foot elevation I get about 0.85 gallons a minute when efficiency is really right on the money and uh, flow input is good still at 0.85 gallons a minute and if you can run every day for 1440 minutes a day I'm still taking home 1224 gallons a day which is absolutely way more than I need for my homestead and farm here. So um, that is a good chart to go by. Uh, let's just look at table three. They're talking about an inch and a quarter, schedule 40 PVC pipe. Oh, I should mention that as well. Uh, don't use cheap PVC for your drive pipe or for your pump parts. Use at least schedule 40. Even better if you can afford Schedule 80, although that is significantly more expensive. Use at least Schedule 40 PVC if you're going to use PVC for this. Uh, again, we want super rigid pipe. We want we want pipe that doesn't flex, because the more the pipe flexes under that pressure, the less of that energy is transferred through the secondary valve and used to pump water. You end up losing that energy in flex of the pipe. Uh, see, they're outlighting at three quarter inch, schedule 40 PVC. I will say this uh, if you're trying to save some money and you want a line that you can run all over the place and, uh, and not have to do a bunch of PVC glued fittings and all that sort of stuff, I would use the, uh, the black uh, coil pipe or poly pipe, it's called, or well pipe. It's, uh, well, you'll see it in my videos there. It's the black stuff and it's super flexible. You can get fittings for it cheap. You can cut it and uh, and put new fittings in it real easy, and you don't have to use PVC glue. Um, I would recommend you get uh, the uh, uh, the barbed type fittings and use uh, appropriate stainless steel clamps for it uh, if you're working under any serious pressure. Uh, they're talking about different pressure chamber sizes. See, they're saying 36 inches here uh, for the inch and a quarter pump. I would say that's a good size to go with anything uh, inch and a quarter, inch and a half. I, I would say that probably even would work for the two inch pump. You might want to go to a 48 inch length chamber for that. And they're using four inch here and uh, I have four inch on mine as well. Uh, let's see, they're doing inlet pipe length 100 feet, outlet 40, drive water elevation 4 foot. So they're driving with 4 foot there. And this is some real world tests that they did. Um, we'll go over this. I did discuss this briefly earlier in the video about the threaded plug, but this will give you a, a good understanding of what happens when uh, if your bladder bursts in your pump or if, like me, you're not running a bladder and you're just using the air pressure in the chamber. <coughs> over time, that air will dissolve into the water and you'll lose that, that air ballast in there. So it's good to shut the pump supply water off occasionally and open that secondary T-valve. This is another reason that's really handy. And drain that out and let air flow back up into that pressure chamber. And then when you close that back up, you have trapped air again.
if it if you don't have air in there this pump will tear itself apart because all that water shock is not being cushioned by anything that water shock ends up transmitting throughout the entire system and it will tear fittings apart you'd be amazed how much actual energy is there so let's just look at this quick uh, we'll read the note first Note that we used a 4 inch threaded plug and a 4 inch female adapter for our test pump instead of the recommended 4 inch glue cap shown in the figure. Two days after installation, the pump air chamber was effectively waterlogged due to leakage past the threads of these two fittings, which was shown by the pronounced impulse pumping at the outlet discharge point. If the pump were allowed to remain waterlogged, it would shortly cease to operate and may introduce damage to the pipe and other components due to pronounced water hammer pressure surges. Uh, the large range of expected values for shutoff head is due to the unknown efficiency of the pump. Typical efficiencies for ram pumps range from 3 to 10 feet of lift for every 1 foot of elevation drop from the water inlet to the pump. And so I said generally 1 to 10, but you can see here that depending on what your water delivery needs are and your situation, you can actually uh, move water a lot further than you might expect. Um, Anyway, if you look at this, uh, at installation, uh, their shutoff head was 5 to 17 PSI, uh, at 22 PSI here. Uh, after installation of the water log, it was 50. After clearing, it went back to 22. Uh, operating head at 10 PSI, 10 PSI, 10 PSI. Flow rate, uh, 0.5 to 1 gallons a minute. The 0.28 gallons a minute in installation. After installation, when it was waterlogged, they were getting 1.5 gallons a minute, but surging. And then after they cleared the water log, it went back to 0.33 gallons a minute. So that's one thing you'll notice if your bladder starts to go or if your air uh, space in your pressure chamber starts to fail, you'll see on the delivery side, you'll see each pump pulse cycle come out in the form of a surge of water and it'll start surging so if you see your water delivery surging on and off in pulses instead of a fairly steady flow that's an indicator you got a pressure chamber problem and you should probably get down there and shut it off as quickly as possible to avoid damaging your pump um, let's see they got a couple of snapshots here uh, we'll just let you have a look at these quick This is a good uh, diagram, general diagram of how it works. Um, and you can see we're taking this little bit of fall here through the ram pump and we're pumping to this very high height to the water tank. Um, and they illustrate head here as well. Oh yeah, and they're showing one without a standpipe here. And then here you're seeing one with a standpipe or a water tank, they're calling it, but it's basically a standpipe. Uh, one point I want to make about that, uh, I said you wanted to make sure that your standpipe was up above your water source level. I mean the top of your standpipe. The bottom of your standpipe should definitely be well below your water level. What you're looking to do is set the, the standpipe about midway uh, in and out of the level of your water source so that you have a constant volume supply. I hope I've made that clear. This installation is one option used where the inlet pipe is longer than the maximum length allowed. The open water tank is required to allow dissipation of the water hammer shock wave. I think we discussed that previous but I just want to make sure you get all the details here. Um, here's another sample installation. This is another option used with the inlet pipe is longer than the maximum length allowed. Remember we did our calculations early on uh, for different pump sizes. The standpipe open to atmosphere at the top is required to allow dissipation of the water hammer. You can see they're using an actual pipe in this example and in this example they're using a tank. It really doesn't matter what you're using for hardware. What matters is that your water levels and your volume supplies are good. And I want to remind you once again that whatever size drive line you're using for your ramp pump, you need to be one pipe size bigger than that for your supply line. Remember, we're working with gravity feed here. So if your ramp pump uh, drive pipe is one inch, 
you want inch and a half, inch and a half pipe feeding your stem pipe if you're an inch and a half uh, ram pump drive pipe then you want two inch feeding your stand pipe at least you can go bigger than that if you want and uh, so on and so forth Let's see I think I think that's about everything they're just kind of illustrating some different pieces here anyway again I'll uh, I'll show the link to this down in the bottom and uh, you can go check it out yourself that uh, formula for calculation I will put up as well uh, this is very important for figuring out uh, whether you'll get enough water out of your situation or whether it's worth building the ram pump but you do need to take those measurements and calculations as I previously discussed and like I said the more accurate you can do that the better off you're going to be in determining what your actual real-time volume production can or will be